Good morning. How are you? Woo. Good to see you guys. I hope you caught those lyrics because that is so perfect for what we're talking about today. He is our defense. And when we fall, we fall on him. Woo. It couldn't be better. I tell you what, today God has a word for us. I hope you're as excited as I am about it. The soldiers had gathered around the campfire. And it had been a long and brutal battle. And honestly, it hadn't really gone very good. And as they sat around the campfire, some of the officers were there, there was just this dim circle of light that only went a few feet. And out of the shadows of the darkness, a form emerged. At first, they didn't know who it was. But as it came closer, they recognized it. It was the colonel. And the colonel came. And as he took off his outer coat, he shook it. And all the talking around the campfire stopped. Every eye was on the colonel. As he stared at his coat, he saw not one, but two bullet holes that had pierced his coat where the shells had gone clean through. And almost as if to convince himself they were real, he put a finger through both holes, and his officer saw this. But it's what was said next that was so eerie. One officer leaned forward, and just in the dim, pale light, his eyes grew wide. He said, Sir, I think you have another hole in your hat. And the colonel took off his hat and he examined it. And indeed, there was yet another bullet hole clean through his hat. And as he stared there in disbelief, the silence was deafening. And all the soldiers, even though they recognized who we were, thought the same thing. And one was brave enough to voice it. He looked at him and he said, sir, who are you? The colonel didn't answer because of course they knew who he was. But they felt compelled to ask again, who are you? The question wasn't one of identify yourself, please, but rather what matter of man has God's protection like this? In this day, He had survived not one, but two bullet holes through his coat, yet had remained completely unharmed. One through his hat, and not one, but two horses had been shot out from underneath him. And he was completely unharmed. Some unseen hand was protecting him. Some miraculous divine force had evidently put armor on this guy and had somehow shielded him from certain death. And his soldiers wanted to know about it. Now, they had told this story for decades and decades. It has gone down in the legends of American battles. That one man wouldn't be a colonel for much longer. He would soon be promoted to general, and then he would go on to become the first president of our country. And while that evokes stories of heroism and and, and makes us go into battle, it is so true for us today. If you are a follower of Christ, then you are in a battle. If you've lived at all, you know this to be true. Search your feelings, Luke. You know this is true. There, there is a battle wage. If you don't feel the battle, something is up. And today, we look at this word from, from Paul here in Ephesians. It is so amazing. We are in this battle together. You're not alone. God hasn't left us defense, defenseless. He's provided every tool we need to defeat the army. And the tragic reality is that, if we're being honest, many of us soldiers haven't even left the barracks, much less put our armor on or figured out how to draw our sword. And so Paul comes along and he says, guys, the enemy is doing a great job distracting you. He is doing a great job throwing lesser things in your path or, or even trying to divide us, to get us to think that each other and humans are who we fight against. But that's not the case. Paul is very clear about whom we are really fighting. And he puts on the, what I call this master class for self-defense. And it's right here in Ephesians chapter 6. So if you're ready to dive in and see what all you have at your disposal, turn with me there. Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 10 through 17. While you pull that up, let me welcome those who are streaming with us today. If you're joining us online, welcome. It is great to have you with us too. God bless you. Ephesians 6. Let's follow along together. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles means the cunning and clever, almost deceptive tactics, okay? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, that's each other, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shooed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, don't miss this, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Wow, y'all, this is a battle plan. And we read this, and I think we gloss over this, or maybe we've become so familiar with this, we don't understand what all this means. But something very interesting should jump out at you right here, just in the first two verses alone. There is a word that Paul keeps repeating. It is one word that's used no less than six times in just two verses alone. And that word is against. Listen to it. He says, we stand against the wiles of the devil against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. But then he says, but not against flesh and blood, not against each other. Every single time Paul mentions another class of spiritual enemies, and that's what that list is, principalities and rulers, he's going through Satan's hierarchy right there, and he's knocking them out. Make no mistake, the devil is organized. He is smart. He is clever. We do him a disservice when we think, oh, he's just some haphazard guy. Just no, 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 no. Remember, he's the ultimate imitator. He's the counterfeiter. He sees God's hierarchy and he wants to clone that. He is the ultimate counterfeiter. So he's doing that. And every time Paul mentions another class, he is very quick to say, you are against that. You literally are to repel that, but not flesh and blood. Hear me, I can't emphasize this enough. Our battle is not against each other. Even though it may seem sometimes that that's who we're fighting, even though people may treat us badly, even though people do horrible things, and after all, it was humans that crucified Jesus, right? That's what we think. We think that it was a human design. Paul was the one who was sentenced to to death in in a horrible execution, and Christians worldwide are being persecuted, and But yet we look at Jesus and we see his very words as he hung from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Did you catch that? Right there, even Jesus, who was suffering probably the worst torture man could invent, recognized that his apparent human enemies weren't even fully aware of what was really happening in the spirit realm. They didn't even have a clue who was truly in control of the war that was raging. Paul is saying that our enemy is not the flesh and blood, but it is the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. And he was adamant about it. But then he goes on and shares the good news. He says, you have tools that are given, and they're not meant to attack humans. They are meant for a different kind of warfare. Paul was absolutely convinced of spiritual battle. So I got to ask, are you? Or are you nonchalant about it? Just kind of meandering through life, eh. Well, after today, I hope all of us will be on the same page. Paul was so convinced of this. The current of this world is waging against you. That war is raging. You should feel it. You should feel the current. We have a swimmer in our church. She is awesome. She goes by the name Mimi Holland. Now, you may know Mimi Holland. She's awesome. We have a picture of her swimming here. I I believe it's an actual action shot. This is her, and I had a chance. As soon as I started thinking about this, I went and I found her. She was here up on Monday, and I said, Mimi, we got to talk. She's like, I can't. I'm doing homeschool. I'm getting in trouble. I'm doing it. I said, we got to talk about swimming. And she said, let's talk, right? So, so we talked, and I said, what is your fastest stroke? If you could, I mean, if you had to get away from there, what would you do? She, she didn't even bat an eye. She said, free, freestyle, without a doubt, hands down. It's my best stroke, too. And I'm like, oh, you are the right one to talk about. So we started talking, and I said, when you get going, I mean, and you are really, really moving and grooving, like, like going for the gold. And it would not surprise me if one day we look up and she has a medal hanging around her neck. She's that good, y'all. She said, when I get going, I build up a momentum. And I said, what happens when you stop? The water that she has built up splashes past her and slams against the wall. That's how much current she gets going. But that's not the cool part. For her to maintain that top record time, she doesn't just turn around at the wall and swim in the face of all that current. (laughs) Oh, so good. You know what they teach them? 
They do their little flippity-doo, and when they do it, they go under that raging current, and they do their little dolphin kick. They can do that for up to 15 meters without being disqualified. They can swim under. That raging current's going this way, and they're going this way, still making record time. Y'all, that is a beautiful example of the current of this world, the culture You don't have to, hopefully I don't even have to convince you that there are people who do not like what you and I stand for. There is, believe it, I know, I know it's shocking, but there are people who think you are so narrow-minded. How do you believe this stuff? How do you love an unseen God? Oh, if only they caught a glimpse through us of his glory. That current pulls against us. And here's the great news. We don't have to fight these battles in our own power. We don't have to flail and strive and, 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 you know, we don't walk into battle in our bathing suit, thankfully, or barehanded. He gives us incredible access to his armory. Spiritual battles must be fought with spiritual weapons. It is an absolute must. And so Paul goes on in the very next verse. He mentions six different beautiful pieces of armor. Let's walk through them together here. Now, first thing I noticed here that was fascinating is I started to study this. When you think of armor, you always think it's protective, defensive, right? And you see six defensive pieces of armor, but something stood out to me. Only five of these are defensive. Younglings, which one of these do you think is offensive? The sword, right? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is so amazing. Six pieces, but five of them are for defense. But one of them is for offense, the word of God. Ephesians says, be strong in the Lord, in his mighty power. Put on God's armor so you will be able to stand against the wickedness. Don't miss that. Be strong in who? The Lord. In whose mighty power? His. Whose armor is it? It is God's armor given to us. This is so important because this takes us out of the equation for pride. It is all about him. He gets the glory. He gets the credit. It is his victory. He is the source of it. It is not our flesh. It is not ourself. We cannot defeat the enemy in the flesh. We do not have the authority without Christ to do that. When people try to beat the enemy in their own power, bad things happen. Look no farther than Acts chapter 19 if you need a refresher. There was a group of people who did not know the Lord, And they showed up, and they tried to cast out demons. And they said, "Uh, by the authority of this Jesus of Nazareth, this some person we hear about, we can... They didn't even finish the sentence, it sounds like, when this demon turned, looked at them, and it was like something out of a horror movie, jumped on these guys, shredded their clothes, beat them, wounded them, and sent them running for their lives out of the house. Wow. That is a graphic picture of the battle that we see. They tried to do it in their own authority, but God gives us his authority. But you have to claim it. You have to put on that armor, and every piece is critical. So let's walk through each one. The belt of truth, it all starts here. Why? Because the greatest defense against deception and false teaching is the truth. It is so hard to identify a lie if you have no standard of truth to compare it to. If you say a lie long enough, and loud enough, the masses will eventually believe it. Think about that. You can't tell what is straight if you only have crooked things to judge it by. That's why God has truth for us. Jesus himself shows up on the scene and he says, I'm the truth. Not only that, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He shows up and says, I'm not just a way, if you like that way. I'm not gonna point you to a way. I'm not gonna show you a way. I am the way. He said, I am absolute truth, and we must know him. The belt of truth in a suit of armor is the most critical piece because everything else hinges on that. Other pieces of armor, other tools, all hang in place with this key piece. If you do not start with the belt of truth, you have no basis for real protection. Our victory in spiritual warfare begins with knowing the truth. Do you? Do you know the truth? That's where it all starts. Then it goes on. Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness, God's body armor. Now, this is so important because in defensive armor, what does the breastplate protect? All the major organs, right? Including the heart. The Greek word for heart literally is thorax. You know what it means? It means heart protector. How appropriate is that? This is God's body armor. It protects all the vital organs. And Philippians says, Our righteousness comes not from ourselves, but from God. It comes from Christ. So it's called the breastplate of righteousness. 
It is God's righteousness, not ours, that ultimately gives us victory over the enemy. God is perfect. He is holy. He is unblemished. He is everything the enemy is not. So is our victory. It comes from his righteousness. Without him, we can't be forgiven. We can't be washed clean. We can't be regenerated. We can't be sanctified. None of that. Without this central peace, we are defenseless. Paul goes on and says, I want to talk about your shoes. The shoes of the gospel of peace. The shoes of the good news, if you will. Now, the battlefield in that day was dangerous, just like yours is every day. If you slip and fall in hand-to-hand combat with the Romans, they were going at it. They were swinging their swords. and they, were, they had these special shoes that were wrapped with leather straps, went all the way up the calf, up to the knee, to make those shoes feel like part of your body. They were so profound in the way they tied these and laced these up. Soldiers had been known to march 25 miles in a day before going into battle. You think these things were good? Think they were comfortable? Would you like to do that? Wouldn't that be awesome, marching like that, like putting on some heels? They didn't do that. These things were phenomenal. They had metal spikes, just like we have modern cleats, that they could attach for when the terrain got nasty. This is so cool. When soldiers fought, they would fight through rain, and the hillsides would get muddy and rocky, and they would slip. Or when the battle was especially fierce, blood flowed freely, and the hills started to get saturated, and they would slip. The one who had the higher ground always won. And the ones who started to slip were in grave danger of falling down. If you fell in battle, it was considered a death sentence. Because if you fall down, not only are you out of the picture, but what about the neighbor who's fighting on your behalf next to you? He falls over you. Oh, y'all, there's a spiritual picture here. Don't miss this. Not only are you pulling them down, but you have disqualified yourself from the battle. Now the person next to you is having to bear both loads. But if he falls, not only have you fallen, but your weapon is on the ground where he is going to land. So it was so dangerous. They said, don't fall down. But if they did, oh, this was so cool. They had a shield. And we're going to come to that. And I'm going to talk to you about the most awesome way that God gives us this shield. The battlefield in life is just as unpredictable as the battlefield was when you were swinging your sword for real against the Romans. And that's what Paul was using to describe this. The enemy, if he could get you to slip up and lose your footing, that's all he can do. But that's what he wants. He'll come and he'll show and sow a little seed of doubt or despair, maybe just a little bit of uncertainty or cause your faith to waver just a little bit, distract you, pull you onto the sidelines, get you away from your Christian friends, those who pull you up. But one of our greatest aids in battle is peace knowing that we are ultimately safe. Hear me. You may have gotten some bad news this week. You may have had something come and rock your world. It may have been a death in the family, horrible news. The gospel of peace is that part that says you are ultimately safe. You have God's peace. You are already safe. You are adopted into the family, and there's nothing that can change that. That is the good news. That is the gospel. And that's what brings peace, even in the middle of battles that we are swinging with all our might. We're hanging on. He gives us more pieces that deal with this, like the shield of faith, the very next piece. This is so cool. There were two types of shields used by Roman soldiers. Now, the first one was roughly the size of a large pizza. Okay? Now, there's not a large, I was going to show you a large pizza, but I ate it. So I can't show you the large pizza. But this is, if you imagine this being circle. This was the shield that was used for display. This was the shield that was used for ceremonies. Or if you got promoted or they brought in the legionnaires and they would come, they would come with this. You never, never brought this into battle. You would be caught dead. If this happened, it was over. This was not an appropriate shield, okay? The pizza box. When you came into battle, Paul talked about a second shield, and that was called the thureon. This shield was massive. It was roughly the size of a door. It could be made of metal. It could be made of stretched skin, sometimes four, five, six skins deep that had been hardened and soaked in water and hardened again and smeared with olive oil so that if fire touched it, it wouldn't immediately erupt. This is what Paul was talking about. These shields were so amazing because not only were they getting bashed with swords, but arrows were being shot. So they didn't use these little round pizza boxes that we always see They used these huge door-like ones because soldiers had access to three different types of arrows. When they could go out onto the field, they could pick either the first arrow, which is the one that everybody thinks of, the common one, which is just a standard metal tip. 
Deadly when fired by somebody who's accurate. No problem here. We're all used to this. The second arrow in their arsenal that they could pick was one just like this, but the tip was a little wider, and it would be dipped into a black pitch tar-like substance that was flammable. And just before it was knocked in their boat of fire, their comrade would light it. And then they would shoot this, and it would become a flaming arrow. Whatever it hit, it had a chance of catching fire. But that's not the dangerous one. The third arrow that they had at their disposal was one that looked deceptively like the second one, except the shaft had been hollowed out. The stem of it literally was filled with a hidden combustible material so that when it impacted against the enemy, it shattered. And the momentum of all the flammable liquid inside continued to go forward and splattered against them. And it caught on fire. And they couldn't get away. It was like the equivalent of napalm. Now think how dastardly and how nasty that was. Even as sickening as a war instrument as that was, that is not what Paul was describing. There is another. When I saw the word fiery darts, first thing I thought of were these, right? Darts. I'm like, oh, yeah, we got to put our shield up and dodge the fiery darts because they're so pew. I'll get you. I'll go pew. Not even close to what Paul was describing. Do you know when the battle really needed to be turned, they had access to something called fire darts, and they were nothing like that. These things were attached to the shaft of a spear and were three feet longer, just the metal iron point that had been filed to a razor-sharp tip, and they would dip it into that same pitch tar substance, light it on fire, and it was so heavy, they ran with it and would thrust it into their enemy. This is almost like kamikaze pilots. This is when all else fails. They take these fire darts, and they ram it, and if you didn't block it with your shield, it would pierce armor. There was no stopping it. When you saw the enemy coming at you with fire darts, it was designed to strike fear into your heart, like, oh, it's, it's over now. They, they, they've gone suicidal. Here it comes. How do you stop this? Because you know once that pierced your armor and it's on fire, you can imagine what happens next to the person inside that suit of armor. That changes how I viewed fiery darts. That changes why I realized how important the shield was. Because our only defense on a fire dart is to knock it aside before it could impact. Are you guys seeing the spiritual implications here? Now, here's the cool part. If you fell in battle and you had your giant shield or your comrade fell in battle, your brothers in arms would come and circle around you with their giant thureons, put them into the ground, and they would come and form. They would lock together and form like a tortoise shell so that the enemy couldn't get to the wounded person. <laughs> Y'all, this is so awesome. That's what we are supposed to be for each other. That's why it's so important for the church. When we come together, we, when your faith falters, when your faith slips, when you lose your grip, we're supposed to come around each other and put our shields around you and form this tortoise shell to where no one can get to you, and we help you up or get you the help you need. They could take it off the field of battle and get the help they need. What a beautiful picture. You know who else has this kind of armor? This guy right here. Anybody know what this is called? This is called the armadillo, and they're so cuddly. You just want to pick them up and play? No, don't do that. Don't do that. They have razor-sharp claws. When these things are attacked, do you know what God's instinct is for them to do? They do this. They immediately go into survival mode, and they become little bowling balls. And they have this beautiful armor, and nothing can get to them. That's the mental picture. That's what the church is supposed to do for each other. When we come in, when you are slipping, when you're having problems, and your faith falters, you become weak, we come, and we surround each other and say, I will help you up. That is a beautiful picture of the shield of faith. Paul then goes on and talks about the helmet of salvation. This one's self-explanatory, or so I thought. As I researched this, you can be wounded and keep fighting if you have a hurt arm or a hurt leg or even a, a, a tough wound to the chest. But you can't keep fighting if you lose your head. Does that make sense? The helmet of salvation is so critical. We can lose our sword in battle, but we can't lose our heads. God comes along and he says with the good news, God protects the head of the believer with the one thing the enemy can do nothing about, our salvation. 
his incredible gift, when he puts that helmet of salvation on us, and our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you are untouchable. Your salvation is off limits to the enemy. Y'all, that is good news. You are put firmly in his hand, and nothing takes that away. That should make you smile. He can't lay a finger on your salvation. The helmet of salvation, no wonder Paul puts it as the prime piece for the top of our body. This is awesome news because it leaves us now the offensive weapon that we have at our disposal, the sword of the Spirit. Last but not least, Paul talks about this one piece that can not only defend you, but also go on the offense in through the enemy's defenses. The most common sword in Paul's day was the Roman short sword. I'm going to do a little hand-to-hand comp. I'm just kidding. We don't have any swords, so you can relax those on the front. But the sword that he used was a 19-inch blade, okay? This one here is called the Machaira, and it is a 19-inch blade that was sharpened uniquely on both sides of the blade and at the tip. So it was a triple threat. It was sturdy. It was very sharp, super strong, but it wasn't so heavy that it couldn't be wielded in battle. So they were able to do all kinds of things. So knowing that, hearing that mental picture, how cool is it that in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, we read this description. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word points to itself. This is so amazing. When the Bible speaks of the word, the Greek term that we most often hear is logos. And that's a great term, and you see it all the time. And basically it means the word. It means the truth. Often referred to as the Bible in its entirety. The truth of God's word, the logos. But that's not what Paul uses here. Paul uses a lesser known word, the rhema. The rhema word of God. Oh, this is so good. I wanted to shout when I discovered this. I was so excited to bring this to you. This Greek word rhema refers to a specific saying of God. It is different than the Logos word, and there's a reason why Paul picked it. This Rhema word has a specific application for a specific battle. Are you getting this? This Rhema word is designed, think of it like this. You, as a believer, have access to God's armory through the Logos, through the word. Okay, think of that as the great big armory. You get to open that up and go in and select your Rhema word for your battle. He has given you that kind of access, that you could come and get a specific word. Jesus showed us this. When he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he used a rhema word of God. He began to quote specific scriptures back to the devil, and the devil had to flee. That is so awesome, so powerful, the difference between logos and and rhema word. Our sword is God's word. It is imperative that we know this. This is the sword of the Spirit that Paul is talking about, God's word. But the sad truth is, Many of us leave our swords stuck in its sheath. Some of us leave it there all week long. Maybe put it on the shelf. Maybe never open your phone app. This is your sword. You walk in, you might as well not even walk into the battle. Unfortunately, we don't have that as a choice. We leave our swords stuck in our sheath. You can't fight the enemy if you don't draw your sword. It's impossible. You can't fight the enemy if you don't draw your sword, and you can't know the word if you never pick it up. You can't know, you can't know your word, the sword. Put an S before the word word, and you have sword. You can't do that, and so many of us don't even rely on this. God is sending us into battle, and he has given us everything we need. The enemy is not those around us. We must fight with spiritual tools. Remember, spiritual battles don't require fleshly responses. They require spiritual battles. So I got to ask, how are you doing with that? God gives us access to all these tools to resist the devil, to fight the enemy. And sometimes we don't even open the armory. What does he think of that? I get get this picture like, Gabriel, Michael, come around. Look, they're going off into battle naked again. What are they doing? Open the armory. Now, if you're a believer, you have access to all of these at your disposal. Are you putting each piece on every day with prayer? Because that's what we do. And that's what we're supposed to do. We'll do that with our kids. We gather them around every morning. Lord, we pray for this battle that we walk into today. We literally ask him to put each piece on with prayer. God, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Give us the shield of faith. Help us to stop the fiery darts. We know that the enemy would love to sift us as wheat. But we know you are greater and you have given us victory. And we literally put each piece on with prayer. That is our right as children of God. Do you do that? Seize that. Take advantage of that. Now, if you're not a believer and this all seems kind of foreign to you, I have great news for you. 
you came to the right place. You can learn this. You can know the one who owns the armory. Let me show you what I mean. Does anyone recognize this famous French uh, general right here? Anybody recognize him? Napoleon, yes, absolutely. Y'all, this is so cool. There is a report that Napoleon, in his attempt to conquer all the known kingdoms of the world, gathered all of his chief generals around, his chief lieutenants, all of his master sergeants, and he gathered around this great big table, and he unfurled the largest map of the world that was known at that time. And he spread it out, and he gathered them around, and they were scheming, and they were moving pieces around, and then finally Napoleon said, enough. And he pointed, and he made this bizarre statement. He said, sirs, if it were not for this one red spot, I could conquer the world. And the one red spot he was pointing to was right there, the British Isles, the empire of the Brits. And he pointed to it and he said, if it weren't for them, I could rule the world. He went on to meet the British at Waterloo in Belgium with a few other nations and finally meet his defeat. He was so prophetic. When Satan strategizes with his demon lieutenants and his generals and he's talking about trying to conquer the world, there is no doubt he says the exact same thing about the red spot of Calvary. Think about this. You could just imagine where Christ's blood was spilt. I can hear the exasperation and the defeat and the annoyance in his voice as he says, if it were not for that one red spot, I would rule the world. But there is that red spot of Calvary. And it changed everything. Calvary showed up. It's Calvary's hill that made the difference in the spiritual battle. Calvary's what won. I didn't win it. You didn't win it. We don't fight it. Thank you, Lord, that we don't fight this in our own power. He won it. We can enter the spiritual battle today armed with the victory and with truth because of Calvary, because of that red covered hillside. That is what makes all the difference. But if you have never made that conscious, intentional decision to surrender your life, you do not know the general who gives the armor. But you can today. Fear not, okay? We've all been there. If you can't look back at a time where you say, I have surrendered to that, to Calvary's Hill, you can do that today. You can meet him today, right here, right now. All right, let's pray together. Bow with me as we do this. Lord God, I thank you that you have given us victory, and it wasn't through anything we did. It is all you, so you alone receive the glory. God, we are done with fighting our own battles and losing and continually finding defeat. Lord, we surrender to you now. We acknowledge you as king. We take ourselves off of the throne of our heart, and Jesus, we invite you to be the Savior that you are. Whether we recognize it or not doesn't change anything. You are supreme. Lord, it's not a simple prayer. It's not some easy believism thing. We know that you require sacrifice of our surrender and repentance of sin. So God, we acknowledge here in this moment that we have sinned. We have done things that have displeased you. And Lord, not only are we sorry, not only do we apologize, help us to walk now 180 degrees away from that in an attitude of true repentance, more than remorse, more than regret. God, we want you to be Lord to show us the victory, to help us to walk in newness of life. You've promised to make us a new creature. And God, we believe your word. We stand on it. We claim your promises and we know they're true. Holy Spirit, sweep away the sin of our heart. Take up residence. Write our name in the Lamb's book of life. We confess you as Lord, as Savior. And we rebuke the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant something along those lines, would you let me know today? You need to tell somebody. We can rejoice with you. Maybe you want to just come and make this an altar of prayer. We do this at the end of each service. We just open. No one will bother you. You're welcome to come and kneel. Put your armor on. Pray for somebody who you know is in the battle that's waging. Ask God to put the armor on them. You have access to this armory, but you need to open it up. You need to pursue that. We can do that. Okay, let's stand together. The altar will be open. We can sing. We can worship, pray. Whatever God's asked you to do, just be obedient to him. This is your time. Dress us up.